Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And uh, happy to have with me again tonight uh, Brother Jason Cripps and Sister Renee Roland will be joining us very soon. She's on her way. And uh, we're going to continue our study uh, on the book of Romans. Uh, so far, we've completed it all the way through Romans 6, verse 12. So we'll begin with, with verse 13 tonight. So before we get started, though, uh, Brother Cripps, I uh, want you to say hi to the chat room and the audience. And uh, also, there's probably some people who don't know you and, and what you're doing. So uh, uh, introduce yourself and your channel to everybody. Sure. Thanks, Brother Luke. Um, my name is Jason Cripps, and my channel is, I'm part of a channel called True Story Live, and we come on Sunday night at 9 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'm on a few other channels as well. I'm on uh, Talk and Doctrine for Monday's Milk. I'm on this uh, very show that you're listening to tonight on uh, Sin City Preacher's channel, and I'm a guest on... Uh, uh, pretty much when somebody uh, asks me to be part of something, I usually say yes. Also, um, Soldier for Christ, I uh, work uh, with him on Saturday nights. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just saying yes to everything, I guess. <laughs> um, I just enjoy it. Uh, it it's uh, being on YouTube and being part of especially spiritually based uh, broadcasts uh, has been a real blessing and i've come to know so many of the people in the chat room from just them being on all these different shows and it is wonderful and i especially like this one um uh the, the bible study situation and having a chance to um have an opinion with brother luke and uh when renee is here also with her and even with steve a couple times he's uh, been a guest uh on the panel as well so that's all I have to say, and I'm looking forward to another study, and uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Mm. All right. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, the chat room. Uh, let's see who's there. We got uh, Dan A. Mann, who's recently born again. Brother. I awesome. Call him, I call him brother, brother Dan now. Brother Dan A. Mann. Yeah, <laughs> and we got Ma Mano Karan. I don't know who Ma Mano Mano Karan is. Um, if you've been here before, I'm sorry I haven't met you before, but uh, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome. I hope that uh, you enjoy the uh, Bible study night. And maybe you'll want to join us all the time. Hello, Carol and Celine. Uh, Good to see you, Carol. Yeah, Brother Hendricks. Yeah, I just uh, saw the comment you sent me about last week's study, uh, Brother Hendricks. Uh, Janine just came in. She's new. Janine, yes. Yeah, she just okay. popped in. All right. Yeah, so uh, for the people who are a regular uh, participant in the congregation, um, welcome back. Thanks for joining us uh, in all these studies. And uh, if you have a ranch or you're a moderator, um, appreciate what you do as a moderator. So if we do happen to get a troll in here, we, we haven't been bothered by it much lately. I I think they they they... they they're not absolutely stupid people, so they do realize eventually that uh, we we don't put up with them. We uh, we just get rid of their comment and get rid of them immediately and don't engage them. So they eventually realize that they're not going to get to us, and therefore they, they they know they're wasting your time and they they leave. So keep doing a good job um, uh, dealing with those trolls uh, and. Um, also, moderators, if you do see someone in here that you don't recognize, perhaps it's their first time, please take a little time to acknowledge them and, and uh, welcome them. Um, all right, brother. Um, Renee will be joining us anytime, but let's go ahead and begin in the scriptures. Uh, and uh, I'll start off by reading uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 13 in KJV. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Okay, brother. Uh, um, maybe uh, maybe we need a little bit of context. Uh, uh, 
Uh, uh, let me let me go back a few verses and read it to, to kind of catch up, you know, connect it to the last week's study. I'll, I'll start with uh, a verse uh, nine. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteous unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. All right, Brother Kripsky, so now you have some context for verse 13. What were your thoughts? Ah, that's a great verse to start on, verse 13. So um, if, for those of the people that were here last week, um, I used the analogy about uh, being zombies and being quickened uh, by the Holy Spirit and becoming alive. So if we uh, continue to keep that idea in mind, so the first the, the first verse we're looking at, yield, uh, uh, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. To me, that means all of the things that God gives us that we use in our body, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our mind, all of those things, um, yielding them not unto unrighteousness, to sin, to doing things that you used to do when you were a a mindless zombie walking around and not uh, you you have a different desire that you that comes upon you when you uh, have the Holy Spirit quickened in you your spirit is alive and no longer dead and so um, don't uh, follow the things that you used to follow um, and and the beauty of it is is he gives you those new desires you don't have to try to figure Figure out what uh, you should be doing and what you should be saying, what your hands should be doing, where you should be walking. Uh, the Holy Spirit walks through that with you. Um, and you're changing then your uh, formerly instruments of un unrighteousness into instruments of righteousness. And that comes through the relationship with him. Great start. Mm. What do you think? Well, um the thing is, um, the the word members. It says, uh, uh, "Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin." Now, mm -hmm. uh, you would think that member, or at least I, my first thought is that member is uh, well, any part of your body, right? Whether your eyes. Yeah. Looking at things and, and uh, you know, say looking at pornography or looking at uh, someone and being uh, thinking of uh, you know, in them sexually and uh, uh, lusting after them or, or uh, using any part of your body, uh, your hands, your eyes, your ears, listening to things you shouldn't be your listening tongue. to. Yeah, all yeah. these things that, that we could consider those to be the members of our body. Uh, but then also, uh, I'm not sure, maybe it means members uh, of our body as the, each individual member of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, neither yield ye your members as instruments. So uh, it could be that he's talking about uh, uh, the, the individual members of the church. But more than likely, I think it's talking about uh, each individual are the, the, the parts of our body that, that could uh, engage in some kind of sin. And I, I, I think that's the case because in verse 12, it's referring to in your mortal body. Correct. So, so because of that, I think that the idea of a body, we should think of it as our body and the, our capacity of our body to sin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll read it in the Amplified. Um, Before you do, I just want to say that I think that your your interpretation of it's a good one, though. Um, it, it it could mean both things. It very well could fit into that other category of, of members being part of the body. Um, as you very well know, a lot of Scripture has uh, has that dualistic kind of thing to it. And it's not a bad thing. It's just you're looking at it in a different way. And I think the Holy Spirit brought that to your mind. Um 
you know, to uh, just give it a, give it another uh, perspective. I, I I actually agree with it. Um, I also agree, though, when you're looking at verse 14, it, it, it kind of focuses on the you rather than the plural. Okay, you know, I want to say something here. I'm, I'm getting rid of uh, this Ryan and also getting rid of Billy the Goat. Uh, perhaps those people in the chat room, here's Renee on the phone. Hi, hi Renee. We're live so everybody can hear you, but go ahead. What's up? Hello. All right. Yeah, we delayed the start time till at uh, nine thirty, so we just started a few minutes ago. All right. Okay. Great. And okay. We're Romans what? Romans six, verse thirteen. Romans six, thirteen. Okay. It, it'll be a few more minutes. But okay. I just walked in, so I'll see you in a little bit. All right. Bye. All right. Love you all. Bye. Yay. Yeah, um, so uh, Hendrix, uh, you know who people are, uh, and anybody else who has a wrench, uh, Celine, if you know that somebody's in here, Ryan and Billy the Goat, these are obviously people that are, they're not here for fellowship, they're here just to uh, stir up trouble. Let's just nip it in the bud. I cannot, I cannot monitor this chat room myself because I've got to be busy doing the Bible study. So I'm going to rely on you. Oh, let me give uh, Stacy. Uh, oh no, she has the wrench. I, it didn't look like she had the wrench there for a moment. She does. Uh, so yeah, Sarah and Celine, Stacy, everybody, Hendrix. If you have the moderator's wrench, please use it. Don't let Billy the Goat and Ryan, the, 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 these guys, interfere with our study. Please just get rid of them immediately. Thank yes. you. Uh, just so you know, uh, Brother Luke, uh, Sarah had mentioned that she's driving, so she couldn't couldn't uh, uh, follow along yet in the chat. So, oh, but okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, um, all right. Let me read it in the Amplified and see how uh, they uh, understand it. it says, um, "Do not go on offering members of your body to sin." <laughs> as instruments of wickedness so it looks like the way that they are interpreting it is the way that you know i, I always have and and uh, probably everybody does uh in, initially without giving it a second thought that is talking about the parts of our body um i mean it's easy for me to to imagine or you know through my own experience how we can sin through the member of my body that's known as my eyes i can look at things and by using my eyes, sin, by lusting, uh, uh, I can. I know that the member of my body is my with my ears, that I'm able to sin with that member of my body. Um, with my hands, I'm able to sin by, let's say, I not only lusted with my eyes, but now I touched and I engaged uh, yeah. physically. Uh, so uh, I believe that uh, that's what it's talking about. And, and it looks like the Amplified is agreeing with us that the different parts of your body are capable of sin. We don't need to go into all parts of our anatomy that, that, uh, that engages in sin. But but he's uh, we're being told here to control ourselves. Don't let any part of your body get you in, in, uh, in sin. It says, but offer yourselves to God. In a decisive act, see, in a decisive act, I think that's good. Let me see how it stays in, in, in the Amplified, uh, I mean, in the KJV. But yield yourselves unto God. So yield yourselves to God or um, offer yourselves to God in a decisive act, it says in the Amplified. Uh, but, brother, this is an important uh, point for everybody to understand that, uh, you know, we do have free will. I mean, there are people that say we don't. And I believe that's one of the most evil teachings in the history of the world, that a teaching that we do not have a free will and that God controls all of us like puppets and every thought, word, deed of man, God's making us do it. Now, why is that evil? Because that makes God the only guilty party. I'm, in, I'm an innocent puppet if that's the case. Mm, every, sin, 
every sin that you've done, brother, you're yeah. innocent. God's the one that's making you sin. So God is the only guilty party with that viewpoint. That's right. And that's why I hate, hate the idea that uh, teaching that we don't have a free will. Mm -hmm. But here it's saying, uh, and we make a decision. It says, it says in, in a decisive act, offer yourselves to God. Uh, that's, not, that's not talking about offering yourselves to God to get saved. It's talking about, okay, you are saved. You yeah. have the Holy Spirit in you. Now make an active decision in your mind to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Yield yourself to the Spirit. Surrender to the Spirit. Now, you know, brother, um, when, when people... Uh, preach the gospel saying you need to surrender your life to get saved give your right. life over to jesus give your will over to jesus right you know how you get saved you get saved by believing that you're going to go to heaven because of what jesus did for you and nothing else and it's guaranteed you believe that and, and it becomes true right. but uh, uh i do believe that we need to surrender to god right. we, we once we are uh, born again we need to surrender off to the Holy Spirit. If we do that, then uh, the Holy Spirit is, then is, is going to be much better able to transform our, our minds and our desires. Amen. Uh, and that's what it's talking about. In the, you're yielding yourself unto God in verse 13 in the, middle, in the center of the verse. You're yield, we're yielding ourselves unto God. That's what it is. How do we do that? We do that with all of our members. We do that with our heart, with our tongue, everything that you mentioned, with our hands and feet. We go where he wants us to go. We say what he would like us to say, the kind of things, you know, things that are lovely and of good report, as we mentioned uh, last week. Um, yes, absolutely, that fits in perfectly. That's exactly what we should be doing. Yeah, and then the second part of that verse in the Amplified says, and your members, that, that is, all of your abilities uh, sanctified, set apart as instruments of righteousness yielded to God. So, in other words, instead of using your eyes as instruments for sin, <laughs> use your eyes, use your voice, use your all parts of your body, all of your abilities uh, as instruments of righteousness in service to God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let's see, let's see if the Chat, what's going to happen in the chat room before the next verse here? Uh, They're Spirit holding it down. They're Stacey, holding it down now. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Stacy Cook, yes. Holy Spirit, yield to him. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, when, when we do, brother, I am so heartbroken for all of the believers that we know and love who are struggling with just simply resting. Oh, my gosh. That seems, uh, it, to, that seems to it be. It breaks one. my heart that they cannot just rest and enjoy this blessed assurance. That's right, and I've done it too. Okay, so just just to be clear, I've experienced this in my own life. I've been a believer for quite some time, but there have been parts of my life where I was, and you've heard me say it. I've been operating under my own power. I've been using, operating, and living in my own strength. Sure, I pray. Sure, I talk to him. Um, but I, uh, there were parts of me that I didn't really fully trust him. I didn't understand what resting actually meant. I didn't. I admit that I didn't. Uh, but he showed me. I kept seeking him, and he showed me. He showed me how to rest in him. It's like the verse I brought uh, brought up last week. I, I actually went back and studied that and read the whole chapter in context. And that's the theme that we're talking about. Come to me, all ye that are laden. Uh, the, uh, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. What does that rest mean? It means that we're we're trusting in his finished work on the cross. Uh, we don't have to rely on our own works. In fact, our works, our own righteousness is dead. You know, we're relying on the things that that a zombie does. A zombie doesn't it doesn't have life. It is incapable of doing anything. When we when we have his spirit, then we can truly rest in him. And when we do that, uh, we don't have to work. We don't have to worry. We don't have to struggle. Sure, there's tribulations. There's things, external things on the outside. But when we learn to rest in him, who, who can harm us? What tribulations can overcome us? None. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
the um, I, I guess we could sum it up by saying this: you need to be a Mary, not a Martha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, 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 instead of just being so busy working and then getting angry because you see someone else resting, Jesus said, "No, Mary's the one that's right here. Martha, not you." Yeah. She she knows what is the best better part or whatever how it's phrased. She he, Jesus says Mary's got it right. She understands what's important is just rest. Imagine resting in the arms of Jesus. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, notice too, you brought that example up. I think it's it's good to point out here that um, it wasn't that uh, that uh, Martha wasn't saved. You know. Uh, it, it, that's not the case. It's that she's focused on the wrong thing. That's how a believer can can live their life. They can live their life knowing him. Um, they can live their life uh, knowing that he died for their sins and that they're saved from that. But they can spend their time in in um, in all the things, the busy work, you know, being part of a church and the potlucks and the and even uh, doing the Bible studies and things, even doing all kinds of uh, things that make you think that you're uh, you that you're doing the right thing when sometimes all all jesus wants you to do is uh rest with him just sit with him commune with him um you know as in sitting at his feet and listening to him that's all that we need to do mm -hmm. yeah yeah i can see uh stacy that says yes i struggled in resting brother luke because i came from mormonism and oh. new age. Wow. I, I certainly know that Mormonism, you can't rest. <laughs> it's, no, no. It's so much work based and in, in, in hoping that they they can do enough to, to qualify. And, but uh, they delight uh, in it, actually. Yeah, they delight yeah. in their works. Yeah. New age, though, um, it's uh, there's really no pressure on new age because in new age, with reincarnation, you know, it doesn't really matter. You're going to get there eventually anyway. It may take you longer than someone else to, ev to reincarnate and evolve, but at some point everybody will, so there's really no pressure on you. Yeah. But, uh, yes, yeah, Stacy, I, I hope you're rested now. I, be, I hope you have the peace and joy. Uh, peace like a river, joy like a fountain. Uh, it's If you don't have that, uh, well, let me know how I can help. I, I, Okay, let's go to the next verse, verse uh, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Come on, come on, saints. <laughs> that verse right there should give you, make you jump for joy and, and, and say, ah, oh, Thank you, Jesus. Now, it's true. I can rest. I'm not under law. It's just grace. And, and what, what is grace, brother? How would you define grace? Let's talk about that. Okay. I define it as you don't deserve it, but God gives it to you. And, and grace is the all-encompassing love of God where, um, where he knows that we are incapable of accomplishing what only his son could accomplish. It is undeserved, uh, and God gives it to us. Um, I mean, I can go further than that, but that's that's mm -hmm. that's the underpinning of what grace means to me. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the things that uh, we know that are are part of understanding grace is that it is undeserved, it is unmerited. But our, uh, I, I think it's important to just focus on on the a character of God. God is gracious. Right. And, I mean, have you ever been treated very, very? extremely graciously by another person yes i have yeah uh, how did that go tell me tell me how what they did that was so gracious towards you um oh gosh i uh, let me think of an example there have been several times in my life when someone has treated me with grace um i have a great example and this is done from uh, on a corporate level it's not because the 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 corporation that did this uh, it's not because they were believers. I believe it was God's work that it, that it did. But I had a school loan, and I won't tell the long version of the story. But I had a school loan that the debt of it uh, 
followed me around. It was a personal loan and it went from collection agency to collection agency. And I kept up with for a long time, but during the recession, there was no way I could continue. The, the payments on it were like $350 a month alone. And then plus I'm interest upon that and on and on and on it went. And, it, and like I said, it followed me around and it bothered me that there was nothing I could do about it. It just been one thing after another. And, um, and also because of the recession, the degree that I got, I wasn't even able to, to use it in any way because um, uh, what I got the degree and they weren't hiring for those types of jobs at the time. And uh, it's a longer story, but um, uh, one of the banks got a hold of that debt and rather than hassling me about it, they sent me a letter saying that my debt was forgiven. It actually said forgiven on the, on the document. It was complete and total grace there. I didn't expect that. I didn't deserve it. I deserved to pay every penny of that money back because I used it to get through school. So mm -hmm. that's even on a corporate level. That's not even on a, on a level where a believer has done that. But there's been other things. My dad has been very gracious to me in some ways. Um, you've heard me talk in my testimony in uh, 2002 and I got a DUI and it was very embarrassing and I did a horrible thing and God used it to uh, transform, uh, you know, back when I was working under my own power, it was uh, transformative and changed my life in a lot of ways. And my dad's the one that came and picked me up from jail. And rather than yelling at me and saying, oh my gosh, what a terrible, how embarrassing of a son you are. Um, he didn't say a word on the ride home. The only thing he said to me is, so what were you thinking? And even his tone was pleasant. And uh, he just helped me through it. He gave me rides to work for a while while my license was suspended. Um, it was a real working grace. I didn't deserve to have treatment like that. I deserved to be, um, to be yelled at and I deserved to have more consequences. But rather than adding on to what he could obviously see, I understood that what I did was wrong. Um, he gave me his grace and in in his treatment of me and helping me get through that hard period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when we, uh, I believe one of the worst things that uh, it, it, it happens in with theology, particularly uh, Christian theology, is mischaracterizing God. Uh, oh. People want to characterize God as, as God. He's he's full of wrath and he's angry and and uh, he's uh, um, you have to fear him. Uh, fear just means respect, really. You should not be trembling that, but respect. Right. Uh, of course, we need to respect God. But uh, the one of the character uh, qualities of God is grace. God is gracious. We know God is merciful. God is just. God is loving. God is kind. All, all these things. God is omniscient. All these things, character qualities of God. But let's not forget, it's God who is gracious. And uh, the most gracious thing, I said, think of somebody that's done something very gracious towards you. I mean, I'll give you an example in the Bible that comes to my mind is that um, the par there's a parable about uh, these people didn't come to the, uh, uh, the the feast. So now I want you to invite everybody, even the people who are my friends. I don't know them. They're not wealthy. They're not prominent people, but just all those people, they're totally undeserving people. Right. Let them, invite them in for to, to, to celebrate this, have this feast with us. Amen. Uh, and also, um, I don't remember if it was, I think it was, yeah, it's Jesus that, that talked about do not invite someone over your house who's able to invite you over to their house for a dinner in return. All the while, you know that they're able and they're probably feel indebted and, and will in return offer you a dinner at their house. No, offer the dinner and offer your friendship and hospitality and be gracious to the person who's going to be unable to reciprocate. That's a picture of grace to me. Yeah. I still want to hear one from your own life, though, Brother Luke. When your, oh. your question was, uh, it doesn't have to be an individual, but just uh, yeah. something well, from your I'll life. Tell you, from my life, uh, I, I'll give you examples of grace and, and lack of grace in that uh, when, 
many people that I have fellowship with show me grace every day in that they are allowing me to have a different opinion than them. They're, they're, they're giving me grace and saying, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You don't have to agree with me, brother. And sometimes even they might even have a very strong conviction about that, that viewpoint. Right. And it could be very easily for them to get dogmatic and be offended that, that they, how could you dare disagree with my, my beloved doctrine that I, I love. And I, matter of fact, my ministry is, uh, you know, yeah, we talk about the gospel, but my ministry is eschatology. That's what I'm focusing on, the return of the Lord and end times. And if they're really uh, committed to a particular doctrine and then you disagree with them, it's kind of hard for someone to be gracious and say, it's all right. We don't have to agree on that. Yeah. And then the opposite, of course, is the more is the is the default and the norm for some reason in Christendom, and that is people will not give grace to another believer when there's a disagreement. It's like harder than it should be. Yeah. If, if there's a, it seems like we should be oozing with grace. We should yeah. we should be flush up with grace. We should yeah. have someone that we disagree with and we may not uh, agree with their well, particular uh, here, Here's a, a perfect example right before our eyes. We have the trolls here yeah. and those people are un are not willing to be gracious and say, okay, we don't have to agree on all these things. The things that they want to attack me and, and uh, the church internally secure, they're attacking us about these doctrines that, uh, matter of fact, we're not, between uh, the four of us that are on the panel every Sunday, and I, I'll say this, between you and me uh, on Wednesdays, uh -huh. uh, the, the all of us who are regularly participating in the leadership in this church here, we, uh, we disagree uh, uh, almost every conversation we have, there's a question that comes in and there's some, some kind of disagreement. Yeah. But we, we, uh, uh, we don't have to even struggle with it. I don't struggle with being gracious to you or Matthias or Daniel or Renee when they disagree with me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I might really be thinking, gee, I, I don't understand why they can't see it my way. It, it seems right. so clear to me. Right. And, yet, and yet they just don't want to agree with me. I don't say that. I don't try to, you know, uh, prove them wrong or win the argument. Uh, and they do the same for me. Uh, we we it, we don't have to struggle to try to be gracious. We do it. It's just it's, it's part of the, the the character I think that we have uh, in the spirit that's leading us. Uh, right. And yet you see people like these trolls here right now. Uh, they're the exact opposite. They're unwilling to tolerate the fact that um, I have a different opinion than that than somebody, or, and, and and then they like to lump us together too. And let's say there's a there's a viewpoint that they don't like. They'll ins they'll say that those people in church church are eternally secure. They they believe this, but right. the truth is you cannot say they believe this no. except the core doctrines. Right on the on the core doctrines, you can say they believe those core doctrines. Mm -hmm. But apart apart from that, you can't say they believe that because we we're in a gr disagreeing every day. Right. Right. So I've um, seen that I've seen that play out on the on the Sunday broadcast, especially. And when someone disagrees, they just say, "Well, I don't quite agree on this particular point," and then they make their point, and that's as far as it goes. It, it doesn't become an argument. It doesn't come browbeating. Uh, that's the word I was thinking of when you were talking about that, of, of what the way uh, people are treated, you know, uh, and, and a lot of times it's worse than that. And unfortunately, we see this play out where there's not there's not grace being used. How does that look to an unbelieving world when they see people that call themselves believers? They can't get along as well as unbelievers seem to get along with each other. What's that about? Yeah. we should be above and beyond uh, the way things play out in the world. We should be showing the world by our behavior that we are different. We are set apart. And a lot of times we're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, look what, um, uh, look what the comment that just went up said. That is why I fellowship here. All right. Praise yep. you, just uh, praise, praise, praise. praise. Why praise, praise e just us that okay yeah 
Good. I'm glad that's why you're here. And and this this is this is besides the gospel and the person of Jesus. Uh, the the other thing that binds us together is this uh, unity around the core doctrines, the liberty on non-essentials, and the charity in all of our conversations. That's what binds us together. I'm glad that you uh, you value that. And, and that's probably the reason many people are here. They value that. And then uh, it, it's sad, but a uh, matter of fact, I've said this before. Uh, if you haven't heard me say it before, I'd be surprised. But uh, I said, when we started doing this, Church of the Eternally Secure, I referred to it as an experiment. And I was quite pessimistic. Uh, I, I was very doubtful that it would last very long. Yeah. And as a year went by and we, we continued and we didn't have any conflict, not one time did we, we disagreed every week, yeah. but not one time did anybody raise their voice or get angry or, or belittle another person's viewpoint. No. So uh, I, I came to the conclusion that, well, this is, this experiment is succeeded. I, I'm confident now that, that this is a, this is a permanent and, and, um, so Matthias says it's gone from an experiment to a blueprint. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I'm really hopeful. As a matter of fact, pray everybody, whole congregation, keep this thought in your prayers. And that is that the, the model that we've established, the way that we, our, our fellowship is uh, conducted here, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about us. All of us, everybody in the chat room, everybody who's regularly participating, the way that we are interacting with each other, uh, it can be done. We've proven it now. And let's pray that this is a blueprint and that other YouTube ministries will embrace this and, and do the same thing. It, it can be done. Amen. Uh, all right, so now back to verse 14. Uh, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Brother, what's it mean if sin has dominion over someone, and, and why will sin not have dominion over you? Yeah, it, it doesn't rule over us. It has no power over us. The word dominion, think about it in terms of someone being a ruler over a, a region or a country. Um, uh, a king has dominion over his kingdom. So if you look at it as that you've been freed from sin, sin no longer has that rule over you. For you're not under the law. The law is dominion. The law is dominion because we cannot live up to the law. And that's why Christ was sent. Because Christ alone uh, was able to break that. And we're under grace. Again, we just described what grace is. So um, we're not under the rulership of the uh, of the law or uh, of sin. It's no longer. Um, we still have to live in these uh, flesh suits. You know, we still have to make a choice, as you said, brother Luke, earlier about it being a choice, a decision, not about salvation, <laughs> uh, but about how we live our lives and whether we operate under the quickened spirit uh, rather than the old dead um, zombie spirit. So um, uh, I also want to throw an example there. Um, someone had mentioned, and I think it was Stacy, I believe, that, um, that was talking about her family. Uh, she had a dream that they were released when they got saved. They were released from prison. So that's a great example. So when you're in prison, you're under the dominion of the state. Or if it's federal, then you're under the dominion of the country. Now, when you're set free, you've paid your debt to society. You no longer owe a debt. So they do not anymore have dominion over you. You are a free man. You are absolutely free. Um, excuse me. Uh, so that's that's the way that it goes now under grace that it has no dominion. You don't have to operate under the sins of the flesh. You don't have to operate under the law. Uh, you're under grace. Sorry about the noise. I thought I'd turned my phone off, but apparently I didn't. Well, I didn't even didn't even hear it. But uh, let me let me read that in the amplified. And it says, uh, it says, for sin will no longer be a master over you, since you are not under law as slaves, but under unmerited grace as recipients of God's favor and mercy. Uh, 
so uh, sin no longer will be a master over you. Uh, here's uh, this is another thing that uh, I I find that within this body of believers there are people who are, are struggling with just resting and, and uh, enjoying their blessed assurance and having the peace and joy that they should be able to enjoy. And But then that's one problem. Another problem is there are people that are still very sin conscious. They're thinking and worried about sinning all the time. And uh, so this verse here is, is telling us that uh, sin is not a master over you. So sin's not a master over you. It, now, it, in other words, if sin, if, if you think sin is a master over you, you don't even understand your relationship anymore. You don't, you don't get it. That sin doesn't really have mastery over, over your dominion over you. Yeah. But you're, you're actually creating a problem that's not doesn't even exist. Yes. Sin cannot control you, yes. but you're still you won't um, get it out of your mind. And so as long as you're continually to think about it and worry about it, uh, you're creating a problem that really doesn't even exist. Sin can, does not control you, but your own mind where your focus is. I have a video. Let's stay focused on Jesus. And uh, you don't have to labor and strive and work at all. I got to stop sinning. All you got to do is just keep on thinking about Jesus. Yes. Are we sinning when we're thinking about Jesus and we're uh, we're uh, uh, we're in the scriptures, we're studying, we're having fellowship together, we're praising Jesus. I, at that time, who's sinning? Nobody's sinning at that no. time. So no. all you got to do is stay focused on Jesus, and then sin is not even a part of your life. Yes. I want to add to this, too, because I get a little bit fired up, and I'll try to try to keep calm about it. But the problem is there are so many people, there are so many people that call themselves believers out there, that uh, that talk about sin so much and point their fingers at everyone saying, you need to not do this, you need to not do that. They keep bringing it up again and again. And so, of course, uh, people struggle with that and they worry about their sin because they don't stop hearing about it. And rather than focusing on Christ and his finished work, they keep focusing on, well, you, you know, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. I think the point you made is good. And those same people think that you need to get cleaned up before you come to Christ. Well, as soon as you stop smoking, then you can come to him and he, then he'll do work in you. No, you come to him as you are. And he does the work in you. He's already done the work. So all you have to do is come to him and you can rest in him. You're no longer a slave to it. You're no longer a prisoner. He literally breaks the chains of sin and death. He breaks those chains off. It, you know, it's almost like you being set free from prison and then you hang around outside of the, the prison gate saying, oh, I don't deserve to be free. I don't deserve to be free. I, you know, I committed this. I know I served my time, but um, I committed this, this, this great, uh, this great sin and this great crime. And you don't go off and live your life. You're hanging outside of the prison. You're not in the prison anymore, but you're hanging around outside thinking you deserve to be inside again. That's the way that you live your life if you're focused on sin. If you if you can't get your eyes on Jesus and focus on him, then you're still outside that prison just hanging around thinking that you need to be arrested again and put back in jail. Yeah, yeah. Uh, v. Larson says, sin conscious gives the sin the power over you. Yeah, that's exactly what the problem is. If you're conscious, if you're aware, if you're focusing on it, thinking about it, uh, but if you're doing what Paul says, whatever is good, what is pure, what is lovely, what is a good report, think on these things. And I will add Jesus, our Savior, our, our God and Savior, and uh, think on him, uh, then uh, sin will not, will not be an issue. I would like to ask everybody, if, if you're somebody that is struggling with this, you, you, you're still worried about sin. And you're worried about the sins that you're doing and you're worrying about how sin is factoring into your salvation. If that's what you think, you don't understand that Jesus paid for all your sins. So uh, at least regarding salvation, salvation, it's, it's not a, a sin issue. It's a son issue. Ooh, say it again. Say it again. 
Salvation is not a sin issue. It is a son issue. Woohoo! I love it. Yeah. If, if I had my camera on, this would be one of those moments where I would get up out of my chair and dance around in a circle, clapping my hands, Brother Luke. Yeah. It's, it's not a matter of what you, what will you do with your sin? Yeah. No. What will you do with the son of God? Whoa, that's heavy. That's heavy. So I, I'm going to ask everybody. I mean, probably most of the people here are already um, doing great in this area. But if it is something that you keep on talking and thinking about sin, well, I'm going to ask you this next week. Do not talk about sin one time. If sin comes into your mind, replace that thought with the sun. Think about Jesus. Start praising Jesus. Get into the scriptures and, and uh, get rid of the sin thought and replace it with the sun. And uh, let's see what happens this week. That's right. Don't think about sin and then it will no longer uh, have mastery over you yes. and dominion over you. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And it says, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, we'll go to verse 15 unless you want to say more. No, sir. I'm ready for verse 15. I'm excited. Okay. So here, Paul, again, in his style, in his method, and with a purpose, he asks, what then? <laughs> Question mark. We've talked about this what then, didn't we, Brother Luke? Yes. What then? Paul is brilliant. He uses the <laughs> oratory techniques. Uh to make us think and as a means of, of uh, refuting the false accusers against him and his gospel. Right. Uh, so he, Paul is being accused by the false teachers that he's promoting sin. You know, he says, you don't have to follow the law. He's antinomian, no law. And, and so, you know, Paul's, not not ignorant of this he's he's aware of these uh, uh attacks against him and his teachings mm -hmm. so does he ignore it no he he addresses the charges mm -hmm. uh, he does a, a couple of times in the scriptures he mentions a bad person and by name and again we're told there's sometimes you've got a mark and avoid in timothy i think mean, you mark yeah. and avoid and so he does that but most of the time, his focus is not on the person. It's it's the it's the false accusation. Yeah. And so here, he's saying, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid! Yeah. He said, yeah. God forbid. That's not what I'm saying at all. No. Now, brother, how many times have you dealt with someone where they're accusing you of teaching that and you have to defend yourself and say, I'm not teaching that at all. When did I ever say go and sin more? Yeah, it happens all the time. It happens to all of us in this network, actually. I mean, how often is Renee attacked? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she's getting ready to come on, but she, if, if she were here, she would be able to address this pretty well about um, being someone that experiences that all the time. Uh, it's ludicrous. It's absolutely crazy. It's not a license to sin just because we understand grace more than those that don't. Yeah. You know, the people that want to focus on their own sin and keep putting themselves back under the law. Yeah, uh, we celebrate that we're not under the law, but it isn't a license to sin. Yeah, I see uh, Sister Amanda is here with us now. Hi, Sister. Hello. Taylor Maid is with us. I don't know Taylor Maid, but Taylor Maid makes me think maybe he's a golfer. That's a a name of a uh, term you, you find in golf, Taylor made, made by, I guess, Taylor makes golf clubs. Sure. I, golf, I golfed yesterday and today. Uh, mm. A friend came from out of town to visit, and we, so I was able to go golf. Maybe Taylor made you and I can golf together uh, on the most beautiful golf car courses in paradise in eternity. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, oh, you think this is a separate topic? You think there'll be golf in heaven, Brother Luke? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 it, <laughs> it may be it. You know, a lot of people. Why are, not? There. I'm not saying there's not. Yeah. But, but the thing is, um, most people do have some either hobby or interest that they're just passionate about. And if you don't, then I, I think you're missing out. I think that there, I think that if you develop an interest in something and that you just love it as an activity, then uh, you, uh, I, I think it's a good 
good and uh, healthy thing to do as long as you don't get out of balance yeah and all your time's on that if all uh, all i did was just golfing and i wasn't doing any ministry and i wasn't praying and it wasn't reading the bible all these things then of course it's out of kilter but if you got things balanced there is time for your passions and your hobbies and interests but the thing is there are some people that they they actually say that they they couldn't ha imagine heaven without this thing mm -hmm. without their pets without their golf without their whatever it is that they think is <laughs> so right. that's what, what they may be forgetting is that um uh, uh maybe what we're going to see in heaven well i have i should not say maybe I, i'm sure what we're going to see in heaven in paradise and for eternity is so much better than anything that we've ever experienced and it says no uh, eye has seen no ear has heard no mind has conceived mm -hmm. the good things god has prepared for those who love him mm -hmm. so uh, as much fun as you have doing your hobby yeah. As much fun as you have and enjoy, you enjoy doing in anything, mm -hmm. uh, that stuff, you may just totally forget about that because you're, you're so blown away about the, 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 the joy and bliss of, of the beauty of eternity. Yes. Uh, but th then on the other time, man, God may, may say, well, you, I know you love golf so much that uh, I'm going to give you the greatest golf courses that, that exist on steroids, uh, ten times better than they ever were on the old world, and 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 you know uh, I got a tea time for you. And that's it. I want to add this real quick. What you're talking about because th this world is a shadow. It's simply a shadow of of paradise. It's a shadow of eternity. Okay. So there are things that we do here that it is going to be like that uh, there, but 10 times better. And it says that it's beyond anything we could ever ask for or think of. So if you can imagine playing golf on in paradise, the best golf course you could ever imagine that God designed, um, uh, it, it's beyond that, I believe. And people don't have to worry about experiencing uh, paradise without all the things that they enjoy. I don't think that we serve the kind of God that's just going to um, put us into a situation where we never get to do those things. Um, you know, I don't know for sure. Does Does the Bible say specifically that thou shalt play golf in heaven on a great, the greatest golf course ever made? No, it doesn't say that. But again, this world is simply a shadow of the real thing we see through a glass darkly. And I know that's not talking specifically about... Uh, about heaven, but uh, it's very true that this is just a shadow. These bodies that we live in are a shadow of our eternal bodies. The uh, relationships that we have here are just simply a shadow of the relationships that we'll have there. Um, you know, it's it, it's clear when we see the picture of Christ in his uh, first fruits, his eternal body, that he surpassed the abilities that we have in our mortal bodies. And so that's the way I choose to to look at uh, heaven, me personally. And I feel great joy in that, that I don't have to look at it as if I'm, oh, I'm giving up golf or I'm giving up all these other things. Um, I'm looking at it as there's, there's plenty of joy in expecting what God has planned for us. Hey, Renee. Hey, beloved saints. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry I'm late. You know, my little crippled, gimpy butt is a little bit slow. Yeah. It's all right, sister. I'm glad you, you made it. And uh, um, with two of us, I think that uh, the microphone it won't be an issue. But I think with three of us, we probably ought to mute when we're not taking talk. You got it, buddy. The more you get, the more likely you are to have to get feedback and audio quality. goes. I'm good. used to doing that with the Church of the Eternally Secure anyway. It's habit. Okay, uh, sister, have you? Uh, we won't. We started with verse thirteen, and we've done verse thirteen, verse fourteen, and we're on verse fifteen. I don't know how much you've heard, but give us your thoughts on verses thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. If you have anything to add to what we've been saying, well, I, you know, just from seeing, I, I didn't hear much, but just from what I saw when I checked into the chat room, uh, I would like to mention something you've mentioned many times, and I'm sure Jason knows. There is a difference between our positional standing and our temporal experiential standing. Like when it's talking about we abide in him and we do these things, all these conditional things, right? 
Like if you do this and do that, he'll have fellowship with you and all this stuff. Okay. We're already positionally as far as eternity goes, because he's not willing it should perish. Eternal life is a free gift. That's a done deal. Okay. But their conditional situation has to do with our temporal or experiential standing. It has nothing to do with whether we're saved or not. This is you're already saved. And if you do this, you'll grow in grace. You'll be blessed. You'll have fellowship with God. If not, you'll be chastised. You can even die early because sin has consequences. These people are mixing that and trying to say that you got to do this and do that to stay saved or be saved. I just saw a second ago. I already know how they're going to use them and interpret them. And it really makes me sad because it's like, is eternal life a free gift? By grace, you were saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, it's for him that worketh not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Faith counted for righteousness. It's a gift. I mean, I mean, how many times can you say that it's all what Jesus did and not what you do? And if you bring in what you do, Christ is dead in vain. He's of no effect. You frustrate the grace of God, yada, yada, yada. How many times, right? So he's not going to contradict himself and say, but it really is about you maintaining it by your works because they believe you get it by grace, but you can't do this and that. So you're really keeping it by your works. And that drives me crazy. So I saw this here. I know I'm, I'm sure this young lady, I'm not saying, putting words in this lady's mouth. I just happened to see the verse. So I just wanted to address it. Because I'm not even saying she's using it out of context. I couldn't know because I haven't been here long enough. But I did want to use it as an example of taking verses that are temporal versus positional, which is permanent and we can we're secure. So uh, this is the verse she put. First John. It's always first John. Let's just remind everybody. First of all, John is writing to Jews. Probably Jewish believers. He's warning about false teachers. He's warning about false brethren that are denying Jesus. So they're antichrist. He's warning them about another Jesus type thing that are maybe denying the bodily resurrection. Also Gnostics that don't believe that they sin. There is no such thing as sin. But if a man says he has not sinned, he deceives himself. and The truth isn't in him. So the Gnostic teaching that there is no such thing as sin. And so therefore you don't need a savior, right? And then the uh, other side of that coin is that they're pharisaical and they don't sin anymore. They keep the law. I've kept it since my youth. Okay. So he's deceived himself. Then he goes on to teach us that we need to have fellowship with one another and with God. And the point of the letter is so that the, their joy may be full. It's not a, a litmus test to, be sure they're saved. I hate it when, when preachers do that. And the re I know we're talking about Romans, but I need to say this because our positional standing is secure and that was done by Jesus and we need to trust him for it. Um, but our behavior can affect experientially our fellowship with God and our fellowship with one another. And it also says, you know, we know we know him when we keep his commandments. Okay, who is he talking about? We know we know him. It's a personal feeling inside. It reminds us that we know God because we lift him up and we love his word and we love his statutes and his commandments because that we know they're good. And so we know we know him. Also, we know we know him when we keep his commandments. This is talking about fellowship with one another. So we can recognize one another when we keep his commandments. But what were the commandments? Is he talking about Mosaic law? No. First commandment, believe on the son. Second commandment, love one another as I've loved the church. How do I know that that's the commandments? First of all, they're his commandments. Secondly, he's not talking about the Mosaic law. Thirdly, John is confirming that you love one another. And then he ends it with, I, I write to you to stay away from idols that you sin not. So how could he say that if you're really saved, you'll never sin? But then at the end say, so just stay away from idols. I write so you sin not. And then confirms how they love one another. So the whole point I'm making here is fellowship, experiential. And it's the same thing with Romans. We have to know what he's saying, what our uh, identity in Christ is. 
versus our experiential manifestation of who he says we are. You know? Amen. Uh, well, so I, it says right here. I wasn't aware. Uh, I wasn't aware of the, the the comment, but I looked, scrolled back, and looked, and uh, that's VD Larson, and the way she's using that is is correct. So you're you're, you're yeah. Looking, I didn't know that she was using it. It yeah. just made me think. That's yeah, all. Yeah, her 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 use of it was was uh, correct, and uh, okay. the, the point of point your point of course is is, is correct and valid, uh, but. Uh, she's saying that uh, cleanses us from all run, uh, unrighteousness. Yes. It's continuous. In other words, you don't need to worry. You're yes, cleansed. Right. And you're being cleansed all the time. It's not. A, don't worry. It's not an issue. Sure. But sure. Uh, and, I, and again, you know, I'm glad you said that because I was not putting words in her mouth. I didn't yeah. even know how she was using it. Uh, but it's telling us these instructions. This is a good example, Luke. That um, in Romans six thirteen and through, he's reminding us that we're not under the law. Um, and that sin won't see the strength of sin is the law, not grace. And so because you're under grace, it won't have dominion over you. And it also says, well, just because we're saved, does it mean we should sin more so grace can abound? Because he said we're sin abounded. Grace did much more abound. So therefore, shall we sin so grace may abound? Uh, just like they ask us now. So uh, you mean to tell me I'm saved no matter what because what Jesus did? So I can just do whatever I want. I can just fornicate. Well, sh should you do that so grace may abound? God forbid. And then he reminds him, how can we be uh, uh, do be sin when we died to sin? We died with Christ on the cross. So he confirms our identity again and who we are. And this is a great segment. But shall we sin so grace may abound? Of course not. As a matter of fact, grace teaches us to forsake ungodliness. If you find out your daddy loves you and he's just bought you a car and a house and done all these wonderful things, forgiven anything you've ever done and ever will do, just loves you and gives you kisses and gives you a bank account with all money you can spend, is the first thing you're going to do go, what can I do to just offend him? I'm going to act out in rebellion. What is there to rebel against? Nothing. There's no harshness. It's I love you showering with grace. It doesn't stir up sin. Straight to sin is the law. If he just said, now this is this and you got to be back here and you better not wear your hair like that and you better stop wearing them clothes and you better do this. What would happen? Strength to sin is the law. That rebellion is going to, I want what I can't have and I'll show him. But when God showers you with his love, there's nothing to rebel against. There's this not stirring up sin. It's stirring up love and gratitude. Gratitude. It's carnal garbage. It's at enmity with the natural mind, you guys. You know it. They all, what is the first thing they say, Jason? Luke? Oh, so I can just do this and I'll just go fornicate and I'll just go drink. I'm just going to. And then, you know, today they took a personal pot shot at me. I'll just go take a bunch of narcotic pain medicine because I'm going to heaven anyway. And I'll, oh yep, gosh. I sure. I sure am, and you hate it, don't you? you know, the bottom line, wow. they hate grace. They just yep. hate grace. But uh, that, yep. that's important. Yep. That This whole section here, Luke, so important. Sin does not have dominion over you because you're not under law. The law makes you sin, not grace. I'm Ooh. sorry. I had to catch up and just right. don't, don't the, uh, apologize. The uh, I made a point throughout this entire study on Romans so far, I've made it over and over and over again, is that Paul's style is his, it's a rhetorical style and it's, it's brilliant a way of communicating. He's, and it's a uh, oratorical techniques, but he uses a is that prosopopoeia? Uh, this, this could be a, kind of related to this prosopopoeia here. I'm talking about the fact that Paul how many times so far in Romans does Paul have a question mark? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What then? Shall we sin because we are un not under the law, but under grace? Question mark. Okay. What, what then? Question mark. And then another question mark. And the, why is he asking these questions? Just take some time. Think. He's saying, think for a second. Very and, smart. And listen. And he's also, he's asking you the the question because he wants you to understand that 
Rene has been accused of a teaching that you go sin all you want, just like me, the Apostle Paul. Renee's teaching the same thing as me, and but are you crazy? We're not teaching that at all. How absurd to say such a thing. So the Apostle Paul went through this. Renee's going through it. Jason's going through it. I'm going through it. We're all being accused of being these false teachers, just like Paul. And he's using this technique to say, to kind of present the idea of the false teacher and then refute it. We're in good company, guys. We're in good yeah. company. Paul was accused of the exact same thing. I mean, you can see it right there, like Brother Luke said. Shall we? I mean, why else would he give these hypothetical rhetorical questions, Luke? Because mm -hmm. he knows what they're thinking. He knows what they're going to say because the others already said it. Oh, yeah. so since grace abounds when sin is there, we should just sin more, right? Oh, on man. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. He can't, yeah. they can't see you right now. I know. Hold on. Jim wants to say hello. I'm smoking, though. I don't want people to be offended. Don't show the cat. Yeah, yeah. don't show the oh, cat. No. I was Your head will explode like that dude on scanners. I was going to tell you Ooh. something. We got a new cat. Yep, Brooke Amazing. came home. Brooke came home to us today. Wow. Aunt Brooke. And she brought a kitten named, she named him after Lala. His name is Lulu. Mm. Oh, wow. Lulu. I, didn't, I didn't know Brooke, did Brooke run off or something or was missing? She was staying with family oh. for several right. months. Okay. All right, we'll get back to it. Thanks. All right. Let's go, let's go to verse 16 now. It says, uh, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Question mark. Again, know ye not. And it's a question. He's saying, don't you get it? Just like you say every day in your videos, Renee. I mean, we are following in Paul's footsteps, suffering the same kind of false accusations, and he we we see how he's dealing deals with it, and we we need to deal with it the same same way. We answer the question, and I mentioned earlier, there's only a couple of times in all Paul's letters where he mentions a name of a of, of a, someone, and he's uh, singling them out and saying, "Hey, uh, uh, we need to mark them and avoid them." You know, but most of the time, Paul sticks to just addressing the, the, the false teacher teaching, not the teacher and, uh, and 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 then refuting the false teaching and, and saying that, no, that's not what we're saying. At all stop twisting our words. So we're we are really uh, uh, kind of uh, we're disciples of, of Paul here uh, in, in terms of our, our our ministry is modeled after the same thing that he was teaching. And because of that, we deal with the same kinds of accusations. So I'll read this again and then uh, ask Brother Cripps here first to give us thoughts on verse uh, 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? <clears throat> uh, you can maybe figure that out, brother, but I'm going to read it in the Amplified when it's my turn because that's, that's <laughs> kind of like foreign language to me, the way that was written. Brother, yeah. go ahead. I, I can figure it out by his Holy Spirit because this is a great verse. So who do we yield ourselves? Who are we servants to? Who are we servants to? Once once we have accepted his uh, gift, his uh, his finished work on the cross, we're servants to God through Christ. We're his servants. We yield ourselves to be servants to him. We are not under the law. We don't have to obey the law. We don't have to obey sin. We obey uh, grace through righteousness. Our obedience is to God and not to our former slave master. I hear Renee talk about this all the time, about being, a, we're no longer, uh, sin is no longer our slave master. And that's a good way to put it too. That's who, what we were under the law, under sin. We were slaves to it. But when we are saved, we are no longer slaves anymore. We become uh, family. I mean, he used the word servants here, which that's true. We are servants. But we're adopted into his family. We're no longer treated like slaves. We're no, we're no, we're no longer really even treated like servants. Yes, it is, serv it is service. 
again, Renee, I love the term. And it's the first time I've heard someone just pound and pound and pound at this idea um, of uh, one, once we're being saved, uh, we are, uh, it's our reasonable service, reasonable service. I've said that in my head so many times over the past six months, and now it's just natural reasonable service and by the way you said we're no longer slaves we are servants but we're no longer slaves we are his children and a servant doesn't abide in the house forever but the son does abide in the house forever jesus said that boom mm -hmm. thanks renee that's okay. all i have to say about that one renee uh but before you you answer this verse uh renee i want to Tell a death day. Um, I copied your question and I put it in my file for Sunday. We'll ask this question to the panel on Sunday, but this question is uh, uh, totally off topic for the study tonight at death day. So that's why I'm going to have to uh, ask you to be patient and uh, join us on Sunday, and I will an answer this question then about the millennium. Okay, uh, Renee, uh, uh, back to the uh, the verse. Uh, Yep, number 16, right, brother? Yes, go ahead. All right, here we go. Uh, Romans, know ye not? Now, let, let's be reminded, he's talking to, to brethren within the church. These people are already saved. <clears throat> that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, when it John says, he who does righteous is righteous. Absolutely. Just like he who reads a lot is a reader. It's just a statement of fact. So unfortunately, our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's good that uh, we do what's righteous, but they can't save. So this verse is not saying that you can obey uh, as a servant and earn salvation to have enough righteousness to be saved. These people are already saved. So what he's doing here is he is trying to correct some behaviors within the, the, the group. And he's also reminding them that you are, you are indebted because you were bought with a price, with the price of the precious blood of the Son of God. Yes. You are not your own anymore. See, this battle is in our mind. He's reminding them, you died. How can we, being dead to sin, live anymore therein? So we're supposed to reckon our bodies dead to sin. Because as if this flesh is already dead, because technically it is, sin is condemned in the flesh. This old man, he's going to die. Paul said, who will save me from this body of death? And then he thanks the Lord for saving him from it because he knows one day he'll be free from the battle. It is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me in my mind and delight in the laws of God by my members who are against me, et cetera, et cetera. So here, what he's doing here is he's reminding them that when you live a sinful life, you are serving Satan. Mm. And that you should be serving the Lord because he's the one that saved you. Yes. And so what he's saying is when you sin, it brings death to you. Mm. It is if you're a saved person and you wallow and you live in disobedience, it comes with consequences. And you will suffer not just death of the physical body. Do you remember the man in Corinthians? He said, turn him such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that yes. God may save his spirit on the day of the Lord, right? Because he didn't want him building up any more condemnation and making God look bad so his name's not blasphemed. So here he's saying that know ye not, don't you know that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, whoever you allow to control the old man, the flesh, if you allow the Lord to control the flesh and you serve him, you're his servant, then you, or it tells you right here, then you are in obedience under righteousness. Yes. And that's what we want, right? But when you don't uh, yield your bodies, your old man, your flesh to the Lord and you yield it to sin, who are you serving? You're serving Satan. And he's saying, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servant to obey his servants, ye are to whom ye obey. Yes. You're, you're serving Satan, but you should be serving the Lord because he's the one that owns you. 
Yep. You are not your own. So he's warning. You can sin unto death. It'll bring not just physical death, financial death, spiritual death. Now, when I say spiritual death, I mean lack of fellowship, uh, spiritual, like troubling, emotional, mental death, psychological, right? psychological death. So what he's saying is this damaging. You owe the Lord technically. I mean, he doesn't know you don't have to do nothing. But because you aren't your own, like Renee doesn't belong to Renee anymore. I was bought. I was purchased. Yeah. I am a purchased possession. And so there, there's no way for the purchased possession to unbuy themselves from who owns me. Mm -hmm. Bought me. And so because he bought me and I owe him, he gave me eternal life. And as Jason reminded us, it is our reasonable service. Mm -hmm. Know that a son abides in the house forever. Mm -hmm. And because we abide in our father's house forever, shouldn't we serve our father? Ooh. You yield yourself to obey sin. You're serving the Lord's enemy. Mm. And that's not who we are or what we do. And that's all he's reminding them of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gratitude. Um, yeah. After listening to two of you and also reading in the Amplified, I, I look back and say how ridiculous that I didn't understand that verse the very first time I read it. But sometimes the KJV, that, that's why I, uh, I don't mind telling everybody that uh, I read the KJV and the Amplified together because sometimes that old English just tricks me up a little bit. But it, it is pretty obvious once I, I hear you explain it. But uh, uh, I'll read it in the Amplified anyway, just so everybody can see what it says. Uh, Do you not know that when you continually offer yourself to someone to do his will, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey, either slaves of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. That is the right standing with God. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty obvious. But I want that gets me back to something we were talking about before you joined us, Renee. And I, so let me ask, go back to that point for a moment and, and get your thoughts. Sister, one of the things that is really hard for me to, uh, it just, I guess it's the, the, not empathy, because empathy means you've gone through it yourself and you can relate to it because of your own experience of dealing with something like that. But I've never had the problem that, that I see so common, even in our congregation, among the people who understand the gospel, believe it correctly, and yet... They still have fears and worries about their sin. And, and I said, no, the problem is you're sin conscious instead of sun conscious. And if you, you know, if you, you need to uh, 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 focus on the sun, not sin. And I asked everybody, can you go one week? Can you go be between now and a week from now? Refuse to think about sin. If you think about sin, change your mind and think about Jesus instead. Stay focused on Jesus, the Son of God, and stop dwelling on your sin. And if you do that, uh, it's going to make all the difference in the world in your, in your life. And then you're going to be Mary instead of Martha. Instead of thinking about your works and all that performance and all, and all that, and not only for yourself, but, but judging other people's work and performance and no, you're just going to rest in the arms of Jesus and stay focused on Jesus and his love and goodness for you. So uh, what do you think? Do you have any advice? You, I, I, that's my advice to everybody because I it breaks my heart that some of the people that we know in our congregation, that we love, that they still cannot get sin out of their mind. Positionally, see, that's why uh, Peter says, Grow in grace through the milk of the word, not grow in the knowledge of the law and rules. Grow in grace. See, mm. the more you focus on Jesus, you're not like he said, you're not thinking about sin. You're thinking about how much he loves you. You're not thinking about how I can offend him more. Mm. I mean, the problem is you, you, you're yielding your mind. Paul tells us renew our minds daily. That's where the battle is. Put on your helmet of salvation. And then we got to remember to the pure, all things are pure. Mm. 
but to the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Why? Because their conscience is defiled. Mm -hmm. Hebrews tells us we should have no more consciousness of sin as far as positional standing. We've been purged. Jesus purged our sins by himself and sat down to the right hand of majesty. There is no more sin on our account for all of eternity. There's not a place where the Lord is going to say that one sin, my blood didn't cover it. My bad. Mm -mm. You know, it's all done. But people aren't understanding the eternal standing we have Mm -hmm. versus the uh, physical, temporal, experiential standing. And that's what they're mixing up. Yes. You've got to you, look, the, the salvation is done. And but God didn't want us just to get saved and go to heaven. He wanted us to be saved and left us here so that we can tell others the good news to give a good witness and a testimony so we can be a light unto the world. But hmm. none of that work has anything to do with saving us. He saved us and then he sent us on that mission. Preach the gospel to every creature and live by these things. Because if you live by my sayings, if you're like a wise man who built his house on a rock, hmm. you know, this is what we're supposed to do. That's the whole point of us. We are a people zealous of good works. We are saved unto good works, but we are not saved by those good works. And as James says, he wants our faith to be a living faith. He wants men. He wants us to be justified in the eyes of the world so that we can be a a person of great faith, like the hall of faithers, Abraham, Rahab, all of them. You know, we, we need to be living our faith, have our faith be alive for the Lord. But people are mixing all that up, you guys, with what's already finished and done and secure. And it's so upsetting that they just don't believe the simple gospel. You're, it's done, dude. Sin was dealt with on the cross. Sin was dealt with on the cross. Did he pay for all our sin or not? And if he paid for all my sin, what sin can send me to hell? If None. it's already paid for. Mm-hmm. So stop thinking about, oh, I got this sin. Am I really saved? If you're doing that, you do not understand and believe the gospel. Mm-hmm. You don't understand what the Lord has done for you. I told you earlier, the Passover, when they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, It didn't matter how good the people were or how great their faith was inside. They were obedient. They they applied the blood. And rather they were going, oh, we're going to be fine, you guys. Uh, God said to put the blood of the lamb on there and death's going to pass right over us. But in the other house, they might have been shaking in their boots going, oh, gosh, I hope that blood works. I hope we don't die. I hope it doesn't. It doesn't matter because the blood worked. It was the, the, the focus was on the power of the blood and not on the power of the faith or the faithfulness or obedience of the people. That was it. It was all the blood. Amen. The power in the blood. Stop looking at the sin and look at the blood. Right? Right, Luke? Look at the blood. blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. That's it. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What's a good word, Luke, or Jason starts with a B? Stop looking at the the bloopers and look at the blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, um, you, uh, your, your, your point is absolutely one hundred percent correct. The, the, the language you use to explain it is your own, and you, you use the word uh, positional or experiential to uh, kind of uh, categorize these two uh, ways of thinking. Uh, to, to premises. Um, there's another way of expressing it, the same thing that I really like. And I, I've heard this from um, a, a YouTube channel named um, a Street Preacher 1611. Normally, I'm not recommending and endorsing any street preachers because they're almost all preaching a works uh, uh, gospel. But uh, there's a video by Street Preacher 1611 titled Standing in State. And um, the, the, those two terms, those words, uh, uh, to me, make the same point. But, uh, but uh, I like the, the choice of words, the way it's said. Your standing before God is irrevocable, 
irreversible, immutable, nothing can change your standing. You are in good standing. That's what righteousness means, right standing. You're righteous, you're in good standing, don't worry. Nothing's gonna affect that. However, your state at any moment in time could be like, you're in the pig's pen, or you're not in the pig's pen. You know, your, 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 your state of, uh, so, your state uh, changes all the time, but your standing never changes. So uh, that, that's uh, that's the way that I think it. Uh, it I like the way that that uh, he expressed it. So if you haven't seen that video, it's one of those animated videos where they have little animated characters talking. There used to be a lot of those. Uh, uh, I don't know why nobody's making those videos anymore that I'm aware of, but I really liked the, the little animated characters and because people, all they had to do was type in what they wanted. They didn't speak and the animated voice came up and the little characters were acting it out. You ever, have you seen those? Yeah, I've seen them. I yeah. know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You don't see those as much anymore. You're right. Yeah. Um, and also some of them had those weird voices, uh, you know, that what they do is they write text down. Yeah. So when it plays, it's like, you are wanting me to, I mean, it just sounds weird, but it's, uh, the, the characters are interesting yeah. for sure. Yeah. But someone who is able to do the technical part of it and, and, and uh, write a script and, 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 uh, use the right characters to act it out. It's, uh, it can be very effective and good if someone doesn't want to get in front of a camera and talk themselves, but they're good at writing. It's a good tool. Uh, okay. Verse 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. I'm going to read verse 18 too. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Brother Cripps? Yeah, first of all, I want to focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, I want to focus on the first part of this, which is God be thanked. God be thanked. I'm going to tie this back in what we talked about earlier when we talked about gratitude. Gratitude, the gratitude that we feel knowing what Christ did for us on the cross, and we're relying on the blood, as you guys were talking about, absolutely true. God be thanked uh, because the gratitude that comes from knowing what Christ did becomes the reasonable service. It becomes reasonable service. You have to realize how wonderful it is what he did for us and how free we are because of that. So we were servants of sin. That's the former selves. That's the zombie selves. We're running around after the things of the flesh because we are definitely slaves to it. We were servants of the sin. But because we've obeyed from the heart, it's not, it's not a work that we do. But we've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. What doctrine are we talking about? What's the doctrine we're talking about, Brother Luke? Um, the, the, the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith rather yes. than works. There it is. We're no, we're no longer under sin or works. We're under grace, which is the doctrine which saves us. It's the only doctrine that saves us. Mm -hmm. Law but, condemns. If you're being condemned, you are putting yourself under the law mentally. Uh, no, you can be you can be saved uh, by works uh, if you follow the law perfectly from Absolutely. your first breath to your last breath. Uh, if if yep. you want to give if you want to give that a shot from your first breath to your last breath, being perfect. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I had a viewer write. Uh, well based on this verse completely out of context about abiding in Jesus and producing fruit. He was saying, see, you got to continue to abide and produce and follow his, obey his laws because his love is conditional. I was like, really? I thought it said for God so loved the world. And then we love him because he first loved us. He offers it freely to, to anyone who will come whosoever will Come and drink of the water freely. There, there's nothing where his love is conditional. He offers it. The only condition is you got to receive it. But his love's not conditional. You're, the condition is you can't you can't have the love if you reject it. Um, 
Brother Cripps, how did we get off of verse 17 and 18? Were you in the middle of explaining it? I don't remember. You I, well, I was, but that's okay. Anybody can interject anytime, yeah. and it's, oh, it's, oh, it's oh. all valuable. Uh, um, just uh, verse 18, being made free from sin, we're, uh, again, uh, what I love about Paul, especially in Romans, he keeps repeating the same thing over and over because even back then, as you said earlier, he was being attacked and being accused of the same things that we're being accused of. So he keep try, he keep uh, was trying to drive this these points home again and again. Some of the verses even seem repetitive in some way, but they have to be because it's still a problem today. So being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Okay, so again, we, we're contrasting. Earlier, we're talking about being servants of sin. We were servants of sin in the in verse seventeen. That's what we were. That's our former selves. But now that we're free from sin, we become servants of righteousness. And again, as I said earlier, yes, we are servants, but that's not the way we're, we're family. He looks, as, he looks at us as adopted family, and we're not servants to sin. We're servants to righteousness through Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me read in the Amplified, uh, those verses. It says... Uh, but thank God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient with all your heart to the standard of teaching in which you were instructed and to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become the slaves of righteousness, that is, of conformity to God's will and purpose. Well, it, to me, the... Um, uh, the, the thank you, I, 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 you know, I, sometimes people might think I'm being a little ridiculous or funny, but uh, I like to, thank you, Jesus, thank you, thank you, woohoo! I don't think that's ridiculous or funny at all. I think that's, that's reasonable service, Brother Luke. <laughs> I know that a person does not have to respond to the gospel like that to get saved, to prove they're really saved, but it astounds me how a person would not. If, if they see the light and it, 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 can they conclude, I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus did to me, it's guaranteed, nothing can change it. I mean, they should be jumping for joy. We should be, thank you, Jesus, all day long. And not only that, here, Paul saying, thank you, Jesus for freeing us from this bondage of sin. And and yet, uh, as you said, Brother Cripps, why does Paul repeat himself over and over and over again? Why does Sister Renee repeat herself? Sometimes I just said that. Two or, I, she... <laughs> two or That's three what minutes. I said, Luke, in the chat room. I said, Jason, he has to keep repeating it. People won't get it. They just won't get it. I mean, you want it verse Luke one yep. of verse and then ignore just tons of clear ones yep out of yeah. context out of context out of context out of context again and again and again they over and over love and over the bad news they love a way to exclude people because they, they they meet their own vague stupid standards they think they they of yeah. right yep but they're the brother they're the brother that refuses to come into the party and the prodigal yeah. son comes home that's what they are now, yeah Let's look, let me look at this word here because here's here's something that the 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 false teacher that follows Paul around, the false teachers that follow Renee around, and they are going to jump on this word, but ye have obeyed from the heart. <laughs> see, see, I told you, you gotta obey, you gotta be obedient. This is he's saying obey 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 this doctrine. Stop being a false teacher. Stop believing the false teachers. Obey the doctrine that I've taught you. That Paul said, works are not part of your salvation. It's not a formula. One plus two is one plus one is two. Faith plus works equals salvation. No, faith alone. If you add any works, it's ruined. It's useless. That's the doctrine. Obey that. Amen. Obey that doctrine. Stay true to that conclusion. Great point. Ooh. Great point. I love it. I love how you said they grab onto these words 
but they don't look at the context. To obey means to obey the truth, to obey the gospel, to obey the doctrine means to believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see how it's stated in the Amplified here. Uh, uh, or did I already? Maybe. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. Uh, yeah, I started doing it. Uh, but thank God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient with all your heart to the standard of teaching in which you were instructed. See, obedient to the teaching and to which you were committed. You were committed. You, you concluded that's right. You believed it. You, you're, you're convicted. This is the truth. I and, know some people I'd like to have committed. <laughs> Uh, and then verse 18 in the Amplified says, and having been set free from sin, you have become the slaves of righteousness. That is of conformity to God's will and purpose. So uh, we're set free from sin, but some people persist in thinking about it. So you're, you're trying to, you're putting yourself back in the bondage and sin is, is, and you're antagonized by the thoughts of sin. You need to get the thoughts of sin out of your mind. Think about Jesus instead. And, and then what will be left is becoming a, a slave of righteousness. And that is conforming to God's will and purpose. Now, God's will and purpose. Uh, the, if, if you're a believer, you're a child of God. Now, when, when someone is born into this world, if you had a child born, your hope and your, your instruction to them is you want them to um, um, exercise so they're strong get good food so they're healthy, get a good education so they have knowledge, and then get busy working in a good career and be successful in life. It's the same thing when you're born spiritually. You need to get food. That's, that's the word of God. Uh, you, you, you need to get exercise. That's ministry works. Uh, and and a, a career, a career, your career, your job. But here's the problem. It says here in verse 18, uh, you became the servants of righteousness. Well, God has a plan for you to serve him. Do you know what his plan is for you? Do you know how you fit in? What part are you in this body of Christ? The, the body is made up of many parts. Renee's a mouth. Are you a mouth or are you something else? Whatever it is, you need to discover it. You need to pray to God, reveal to me what my calling is. What can I do? What should I do? What, what is my role? Pray. And, and uh, once that is revealed to you and you are convinced that you know what your role is, then you need to get busy doing it. And that's what he's saying here. Then you will be the servant of righteousness. All right. Um, I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, the next verse, uh, 19. I speak after the I manner of... I didn't get to talk on them. Oh, I'm sorry, Renee. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got such a big mouth. I talk over everybody anyway. Let me see. I'm I'm Easy, buddy. I, I did want to uh, just mention it. Like, I wanted to reiterate that uh, our brother Jason was very clear that Paul says the same things in many different ways. Because he's trying to get it through to him. And maybe if you say it in one way or another, they'll, they'll get it one way. I've had people tell me, you said it this way and that. And you said it like 20 times. But the way you said it this time, I got. You know? <laughs> so, uh, let me read it here. Uh, it's 17 and 18, right? Okay. We're confirming a past tense reality. Remember? We're confirming our identity in Christ. Something that's already been finished. Because in 18, he says... Being then made free from sin, ye became, past tense, the servants of righteousness. And that is exactly who you became when you received Christ. Now, because you are a servant of righteousness, you should be doing your job and serving righteousness. 
That's what you should be doing. Why? Because you are indebted to the one that bought you and you should be a servant of righteousness and not of sin. First of all, it brings death to you uh, in many areas of your life and to others. So in 17, it says, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Do you see how he's encouraging them to stay away from sin and to live under righteousness in the prior verse, right? But then he confirms who they actually are already positionally in God's sight. So he said, but God be thanks that ye were the servants of sin. See, God made them not servants of sin anymore when he saved them. But ye have obeyed, like Brother Luke said, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And what is that? That God saved you through his grace because his son took on he died not just for you but as you he became a surrogate you on that cross yes. he all the sin of the world on that cross now if i already died on the cross because these people don't get this when jesus died it says don't you know you died with christ why because he became me he became i'm going to do this real personally jesus became renee on the cross so renee died on that cross for my sins how can i die a second time when i've already died why are they trying to put them back on a cross why are they trying to put themselves back on the cross they don't get it they don't get it so what he's saying here is how can i how can i suffer the second death when i've already suffered the first one but it was really jesus who suffered the first one but he became renee on the cross you see boom, boom, you don't boom, get boom. that right you see right. what I'm saying? Yes. So, but God be thanked that ye were servants of sin. Again, telling you who you are. But ye have obeyed. I love that Brother Luke brought that. I love that word obey. Like you're keeping Mosaic law. And say none about sin or law or none of that. He's saying you obeyed from the heart, the form of doctrine, which is what? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus purged your sins. And now you're justified and right standing made righteous declared righteous sanctified declared holy i said before just like the items in the temple like the showbread table the showbread table didn't do anything good he didn't keep the law it's an item it's an inanimate object yet it's called holy and sanctified well we're holy and sanctified by the offering of jesus's body that's what it says in hebrews it is the blood that sanctifies us makes us holy that's why he says you trample the son of god on the foot you call the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified made holy an unclean thing despite the spirit of grace or an unholy thing despite the spirit of grace and so you did you obeyed the form of doctrine you obeyed that jesus did it for you and it's by grace that you're saved and then being made free from sin why am i free from sin because i already died i can't a dead man can't sin First of all, mm -mm. you became the servants of righteousness. So he's confirming who you are now. Okay, now when that happened, you became a servant of righteousness. So you can't serve sin. You're serving Satan when you do that. You're not your own. So he's reminding them what their purpose is while they're still here. Mm -mm. Well, when you said a, a dead man can't sin, it made me think, uh, recall uh, last week, uh, Brother Cripps, I was trying to give you uh, a recount, a story with um, Bible Jim. He's the leader of the National Street Preachers Association, Bible uh -huh. Jim. Uh, he and I were talking and I was, um, I was offended by something or not him, or, but we're talking about something that offended me and he turned to me he says luke a dead man cannot be offended and uh that's um and it really hit me and, and, and i've never stopped uh thinking about about that and uh, uh it showed me how where i was in in, in maturity sure and I, uh, I really, uh, I think I've grown since then. That was probably about 10 years ago. Let me ask you. Yeah. 
do, do dead men owe any more um, taxes? Does IRS uh, come by the grave and and uh, drop a? Amen. Uh, Amen. No. Oh my gosh, that's awesome, Jason. You Praise know what God. else Jesus said? Does the does the son or the inheritor pay taxes, or does the stranger? There it is. When he asked him, mm -hmm. when it, and he was like, "Yeah, but go ahead and pay it. We don't want to offend anybody." Yeah. You know, I love it. I love it. That's brilliant, Jason. Thank you. Praise God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now, how are we doing on time? Uh, we uh, we've got we've got fifteen minutes. I, I was late. So if you want to hang a little bit later, okay. I can. All right. So let's let's go for 14 more minutes. And, and I, I don't know if we'll get through the end of this chapter, but I don't want to I don't want to rush through it too much. But I, I do want I'd love to get to for 23. 23, of course, is one of the greatest verses we have. You don't want you don't want to rush through it with this group uh, when uh, uh -huh. everyone's on fire. You want to take your time with it and, and spend the spend the time we need to helping Paul pound this message home. Yes. Okay, well, let's go farther. If we don't get through it, it's okay. But uh, verse uh, uh, 19. 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Okay, uh, Renee, why don't you go first on these two, 19 and 20. Give me just a second here. I was typing something. I just wanted to finish typing it over to the chat room. All right. You, you just, want you want Crips to go now first then while you're doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brother Crips, 19 and 20. Yeah, no problem. The first thing I want to focus on is the word infirmity. What does infirmity mean? Uh, what does it mean if you say someone is infirm? Okay, so our bodies, if we're sick, if we're, we have some disease, you know, we're not working normally, uh, that's a term to use to describe that. You're you're not flush. You're not working at full capacity. You've got something going on uh, in your flesh. So he's using that word here, which means the same thing now. You know, uh, an infirmary was the place where people that were injured go or sick. That's or had disease. That's where they go. Infirmary. Um, it's a military term. They use it a lot of the military, uh, you know, uh, uh, but uh, that's what it means. So our infirmity of the flesh for as you have yielded your members as servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity. Iniquity is a uh, similar word to sin. Um, that's the that's again. He's Paul is again trying to bring this point home that he's been describing in the, in the past several uh, verses. The contrast. Paul is great with the contrast. He presents one thing. This is the way you were. This is the way it used to be. Your the infirmity of the flesh. You're you're a slave to sin. You're a slave to unrighteousness. You're yielding your bodies to that. Okay, that's the first part. And then the second part is, but here's where you are now. So now you yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. Holiness is another word that people get confused. They take the word holiness and they think, oh, we're supposed to live, oh, in the holy, in a holy fashion, which to them means that we're we're supposed to uh, focus on sin and avoid that, and that's what we're supposed to focus on. Guess what? We are not capable of being holy without Christ. In fact, you can't even use the word for to describe our former selves. We're in no ways holy. The way that someone achieves holiness is not by living a chaste life and avoiding sin. No, it's by the way that Jesus, the way his spirit lives in us, makes us holy through him. We're not capable of it. We're not. If we were capable of it, Christ never would have had to come. He never would have had to die and be raised again. If we were able to do it ourselves, there was no point in Christ coming at all, but we could not do it because we were dead. A dead man cannot do anything. All he can do is follow uh, follow after the flesh. Oh, my gosh. You made such an important point. It's not that we were just 
lost or fallen. We were literally dead. When when you're dead, you're dead. It doesn't matter because they were saying it's a matter of practicing sin. No, it's a matter of if you're dead or alive, period. Amen. <laughs> Verse 20, for when we were servants of sin, uh, you were free from righteousness. Okay, so again, it's the same point. When we serve sin, we're dead. We have nothing to do with righteousness. We're free from righteousness, which can be looked at in two ways. We're free from the weight of righteousness. Of course, that's light. That seems kind of confusing. Let me try it again. So uh, free from righteousness. We're free from um, the part that righteousness plays in our lives because we're not capable of it. And we're also free from righteousness by righteousness because now we have righteousness. And whose righteousness do we have? It's Christ's righteousness. We're not righteous. Our righteousness is his filthy rags. What we bring to the table is nothing. It, we, we bring our own dead flesh. What righteousness or holiness does dead flesh have? Zero. No one wants to be around dead flesh. Nobody. Nobody. Who wants to be around live, a live spirit, alive through, uh, through Christ? Who wants to be around that? I'm attracted to other people that are alive with, with, um, with God's spirit in them. The light that comes from them, the joy that you see in them. Um, you see that uh, when they do things when out of obedience, because of a reasonable service, you can recognize that. And, and you can hear in the way that they talk that they're not lifting themselves up. They're, who are they lifting up? They're lifting up Christ and his righteousness. You're free from righteousness. For when we were servants of sin, you're free from righteousness. I'd like in, to. I'd, are you finished? I just going to uh, one more sense. We're incapable of of righteousness in our in our flesh. Incapable of it. That's all. Okay. Um, I, I would say that free from righteousness means your righteousness is absent. There is That's no what I mean. Yeah. 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 We're incapable. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to read it in the Amplified and, and, and then talk about it. And then, Renee, uh, give me your thoughts on it after I'm done here. It's, it says, uh, um, I am speaking in familiar human terms because of your natural limitations, your, your spiritual immaturity. For just as you presented your bodily members as slaves to impurity and to moral lawlessness, leading to further lawlessness. So now offer your members, that is your abilities and your talents, as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification, that is being set apart for God's purpose. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You had no desire to conform to God's will. Uh, it's pretty easy to understand in, in that language th there. Uh, but uh, so he's, he's saying, I, I'm speaking to you in human terms because of your natural limitations, your spiritual immaturity. Uh, uh, then uh, um, just as you presented your bodily members as slaves to impurity and moral lawlessness leading to further lawlessness, so now, so what, what I really think, the interesting thing about Paul is that it's so far from what he's accused of, of, of uh, being antinomian and just nothing but, but uh, license to sin. Here he is, he's, he's talking about both. You're not under the law, you're under grace. That's the, that's the gospel. But you should be also serving God. He's not negligent. He, he, he's not leaving out our, our what is the word, the, the term, uh, your reasonable service. He, he, he's not leaving that out and just talking about Free grace, don't worry, nothing. you have no responsibility, you have no reasonable service, just sin all you want. No, he's telling us there's two parts to this. You're saved by grace, but but you there God does have a plan for you, and it is your reasonable service, 
But uh, how is it? So uh, just as you presented your bodily members as slaves to impurity, now offer your members, that your abilities and your talents, as slaves to righteousness. Paul and Renee, Brother Cripps, and myself, and all of us who are preaching this salvation is a free gift. Nothing's required of you except believing and receiving the gift. But we don't leave it at that. We say you must believe to be saved, but after you're saved, you should be doing th things to serve God. So I think that, you know, you can see clearly here that Paul is not being negligent and leaving out service. But he, he is clear, making a clear distinction that there is a difference between what you should be doing and what you have to do for salvation, what you should be doing as a minister. Um, okay, Renee? Luke, I am so glad that you once again mentioned that Paul is talking about service, about how they should be acting. But these aren't salvific issues. These are already saved people. You know, that people take these instructions and then try to say, see, you got to do these instructions to be saved or to stay saved. They don't get it. So, uh, Jason, you mentioned something about infirmity. And I want to mention that the infirmity of our flesh, like you said, is not just sickness. It is also weakness. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to show an example in Romans 14 and 15, where when a person is weak in their faith, they have an infirmity of the flesh. Because it says that those that feel the need to keep the meat laws, like don't eat pork. Oh, here it comes. That, here it comes. That are weak in the faith and then Paul calls that an infirmity of the flesh boom so when you're weak and you don't realize the liberty or the freedom you have in Christ and you are putting yourself to in this little legal place where you feel it's sin because by the way if you do something against your own conscience it does become sin to you it tells us that if a man does something against his own art, it's not a sin to this guy because it doesn't matter to him. He's free. Mm -hmm. But because you believe it's wrong, now it's sin. So I wanted to read the first couple lines and I'll, I'll prove that what I'm saying. If you go over uh, to first, we need to see what they were talking about before Romans 15 even makes sense. Right. Uh, so they're talking about the people that feel they still got to keep these food laws, right? So Paul says, it is, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So because you're free, but he feels he's in bondage to these rules, right? And then you do it in front of him, you're causing him to stumble. And he says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself and that thing which he alloweth. If you're if you do something and you don't condemn yourself and you allow yourself to do it, you're happy. So if you say, I love bacon, I'm gonna eat it. I know it was an old testament thing, but I am not under the law and I'm gonna eat that bacon. And I feel good about it, and God is not mad at me at all. He's like, Hey, have your bacon. Happy is he that condemns not himself in that thing which he allows. Why am I mentioning that? Because it's another way that your flesh is infirm. It says, and he that doubteth is damned if he eats. Do you see that? If he thinks yeah. God will be mad at him and he eats it anyway, he's condemning yeah. him. Yeah, I wanted to add to that. Away from him, even being near him is upsetting him. Stay away. Uh, Quinny is... A little touchy because we got a new kitty and he's scared of Jim right now. So Jim doesn't understand. He's got to stay away from him for a little bit. All right. He that doubteth is damned if he eats because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Do you remember when uh, it says, 
uh, those in the flesh cannot please God, that's in the flesh. Trying to earn God's approval through taste not, touch not, handle not. That's Amen. in the flesh. Okay. Now, what's the next verse after he just explained, blessed is the man who does not condemn that which he allows, whatsoever is not of faith is sin, and if mm -hmm. you do it against your own conscience, you're damned or condemned. You're not condemned to hell, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Now, this is the next verse, Romans 15, 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Ooh. Do you see how that lack of faith and lack of freedom and lack of understanding and the freedom we have in Christ is called an infirmity and to not please ourselves. So he's saying we should abstain from the things that other people are abstaining from because they're afraid they're offending God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're free to do it on our own since mm -hmm. you got a house to eat, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Galatians tells us for the flesh lusteth against the spirit. That's an infirmity. It's a weakness in the flesh. I'm, I'm setting this up. So when we read the verse, it makes sense. Okay. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. Here, here's the thing. People think, okay, behold, all things are new. Yes. All things are new in the eyes of God. We have a new spirit, right? And we will have a glorified body. It has not played out in time space yet, but in God's eyes, we are justified, glorified, sanctified, seated in heavenly places as Jesus is. So are we in this world. It's a done deal. He didn't say, behold, a lot of stuff is new. So you don't sin as much because he's not talking about your flesh and your performance. He's talking about a whole new creation. This dead guy's alive. He has a new body. He's glorified. He doesn't sin. He's perfect. He's just like my son. He's a whole new creation, right? But people confuse that and say, you got to have a new living. You have to be living differently. And that drives me crazy because that's not even what it's talking about. Paul says we should walk in newness of life. Like you said, it's our reasonable service. Because you're saved, you should walk in newness of life. Now, so we see that the flesh is weak. And it desires things that are against the spirit. It also gets caught up in legalism. And both of those are considered infirmities. Okay. So let's look over. Is it 18 and 19? Right? 19 and 20. 19 and 20. Okay. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. So he's speaking in a carnal way. He's speaking to the carnal mind, to the man. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Is he saying they're sick? No. He's saying that they're weak because of legalism. And they're also weak because the flesh wars against the spirit. And it's that dead man. That dead guy is wanting stuff that the new living man doesn't want. No, oh my God. The flesh was not perfected. Mm. The old man isn't new. That guy is supposed to reckon him dead, period. Dead, dead nasty don't flesh. Don't realize that. They're trying to perfect the flesh. Mm -hmm. They're pleasing God. So I speak after man or man because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Because before you were saved, you yielded your members to this nonsense. Yeah disgusting uncleanness and iniquity over and over again. Now yield yourself as servants to right. Oh no, I'm live. Yield yourself to servants to righteousness and holiness. Here's 20 for when ye were the servants of sin. So are we servants of sin anymore? Nope. No. And because we're not servants of sin, we should not be serving sin. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> when servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Like brother Luke said, you didn't have any righteousness and your righteousness was as filthy rags. And we don't need to say what that word in Hebrew means. Mm -mm. But it's far beyond something you wipe your table with. That's correct. So for when we were the servants of sin, which we're not, we didn't have any righteousness. He mm. just, that's all he's saying. Incapable of it. Actually. That is right. Yeah. That is right. Mm -hmm. Thanks Renee. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the only way you have righteousness is if it's 100% pure. 
it's it's not righteousness if it's 90 percent pure thank you you don't get credit for your failed attempts at perfection yeah. what's well, a 99 percent righteousness and one percent unrighteousness is not righteousness it's yeah. unright right so uh, it's impossible for us to get that 100 percent on our we, own yeah we can't but, get any of it when we're dead yeah we but can't get any of it all we got to do is is let Jesus cover us with his righteousness. And then we're looking just as good as Jesus. That's it. I plead the blood. Yeah. That's okay. It. Verse 21. Uh, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God... Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Brother Cripps? Uh, first of all, I, I love every time the Bible mentions fruit. It's just such a good example. Um, I love to use the term being connected to the vine. What does the vine do? As long as we're connected, we're producing fruit. If you're not connected to the vine, you're not producing fruit. So, brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant. Praise God. So uh, what fruit had ye in those things whereof you are now ashamed? Uh, so he's making the point. What what fruit came out of us when we were dead? When we were slaves to sin, what fruit did we produce? None. We couldn't produce fruit. For the end of those things is death. We're already dead. He's talking about the, the, the end of those things is death. The death that is the price that we pay if we do not have Christ's righteousness, if we're born dead, we remain dead, we're never quickened, we're never made alive through Christ, the end of that is the second death. We die physically, and then we we die yet again because we were never made alive. That's the difference. If we're alive, then we only have the physical death if, if we don't live long enough until Christ comes. Um, if we live long enough till Christ till Christ comes, we don't even have to experience the consequences of the first death. You know, praise God if that's the way it happens. But uh, if not, all we have to do is experience the physical death because we've been made alive. We've been made alive through Him. So uh, th thereof are now ashamed. I like the way that's phrased. Uh, we're ashamed of that former self. We don't have to be ashamed, but definitely when when we look at it, and we're, okay, think about it like this: for those of us who are who are saved, who spent uh, any number of years um, being unsaved in that dead that dead flesh feeling, and in that dead flesh uh, uh, circumstance, when you become saved and think about your former self, you're not bragging about the way you used to sin. Not if you're really, really saved. Not if you've accepted his righteousness. You're not celebrating the things that you used to do. No, no. The only reason you talk about the, the way that you were before is to give glory to God in showing others the difference between the dead you and the alive you. You're ashamed of your former self, but with Christ, you no longer have to be ashamed because you're, um, you're receiving joy and gratitude because of his righteousness. Jason, and, when people do those testimonies and talk about all the stuff they did, I call them testifonies. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> testifonies that went to hell or heaven and came back to tell about it. Uh -huh. awesome. That's it. Okay. Are you finished? If so, yes, we're in 80, 21 yes, and 22. Oh, I didn't do 22, but that's okay. Go oh, ahead, Randy. Go ahead, brother. Finish it. Uh, but now being made free from sin. Okay, here's that point again. He, uh, Paul, again, keeps coming back to the same thing. He wants people to know that you're free. We've been made free from sin. We don't have to keep putting ourselves under it. The Hebrew Rooters is a good example that ties into what Renee was saying about that the, the they're, they're trying to perfect their flesh. They can't do it. So by, by saying, well, I'm going to go under, back under the law and I'm going to observe the Sabbath and I'm going to, when I plant uh, fruit trees, I'm going to make sure that I do that correctly. I, you know, if I'm a farmer, I'm going to do my fields exactly like this and that. Uh, they're putting themselves under underneath the law. I'm not going to eat bacon. 
what are they doing? They're choosing to live a life back under the law and under, uh, under sin and death when they don't have to do that because they have an opportunity to rest in Christ's finished work. And then so, they forget they got to do the whole law. They're right. debtor to the whole law. That's right. That's right. So they're still they're still putting themselves in the same position. Again, it's that ninety nine percent slash one percent unrighteousness. They're still they're still putting themselves under the unrighteousness and sin. Uh, so we became servants to God. Again, it's that same point. And then the last part, you have your fruit unto holiness. So there's that word again with the fruit. Again, if we're connected to the vine, what are you producing? You're you're producing His fruit. And it's easy for other people to see. You can tell the difference between good fruit and bad fruit, dead fruit, dead rotten fruit, and fruit that's from someone being connected to the vine. So the fruit unto holiness, that's what brings the holiness is living with that spirit inside you, producing the fruit that God wants to produce in you and the end everlasting life. We have the everlasting life as our eternal reward. And, and yes, we don't have that everlasting life yet because we're still in this realm, but we have the gift of it and we'll experience it. We'll experience, experience that once uh, this flesh dies, the next step is to, to be with him. And when, uh, when Christ comes again and all the restoration happens and we have those new, uh, new eternal bodies, those everlasting bodies, then we will, uh, we will experience what that feels like the everlasting life. That's it. Thank you. Hey, Luke, I wanted to mention, and I bet you saw it in these verses, like when it talks about fruit unto everlasting life, they turn it around and say, see, you're working towards everlasting. But I want to mention that, again, Paul is reminding them of their new identity, something that's already been done and in the spirit it's finished that you are that person. But Paul is saying manifest who God says you are using the old dead guy. You still got to deal with him, uh, but they're not trying to work towards it. And I love that Jason said, uh, cause a lot of people twist that fruit. I even did a first century study on vineyards. To, and by the way, the things that hold the vines up look like a cross, just so you know. Um, that the, there is no way to produce fruit unless you are part, uh, you've got to be connected to the source. So that when Jesus is saying that uh, parable of the, you know, if you abide in me, that you're cut, the, the branch is cut off and cast to the fire and stuff. Uh, that's not hell either. Uh, it's a parable. It's literally things were thrown in the fire because they were worthless. They were of no use. But all he's saying is what Jason said. You can't even do anything good. How many times did Paul say you can't do any righteousness? You were Amen. free from righteousness. Like Luke said, that means absent. <laughs> the righteousness was absent. So uh, the whole point here is that you can only produce fruit if you're in the vine. You are connected to Christ. You are in Christ. And so is it okay? It's my turn to say 21 and 22. Okay. Okay. Uh, so then he says, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Okay. For the end of those things is death. When you were unsaved and you were sowing into sin, you were reaping the fruit of unrighteousness, which is physical and eternal death, right? Yes. And then in 22, he said, again, confirming a fact. This isn't something we're striving for. This is something that's already true about us. But now being made free from sin and become servants of God, which we are, has already happened, ye have fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Is he saying you have to earn it by producing? None of that is what he's saying. He's making a statement of fact about who we are. We are now servants of God. We've been made free from sin. We died. Ye have your fruit under holiness and because you're in christ your service to god your fruit that you're sowing is going to be holiness and at the end everlasting life the everlasting life is a promise that we already have this is something we're striving for amen yes amen uh okay i'll read it in the amplified uh uh 
20 and 21. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Uh, you had no desire to conform to God's will. So what benefit did you get at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? Mm. None. For the outcome of those things is death. death. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become willing slaves to God, you have the benefit resulting in sanctification, being made holy and set apart for God's purpose. Mm. And the outcome of this is eternal life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't want to just repeat everything you said, so I'm going to focus on this, uh, uh, the uh, uh, willing slaves. Uh, now, since you have been set free from sin and have become willing slaves to God, See, uh, Paul's falsely accused. We're falsely accused. But, you know, I, I, I just have to keep on pointing out that Paul is not negligent. He's not a false teacher saying that, hey, uh, how you live your life is not important at all, at all. Don't worry about that. You know, he's just saying that doesn't affect your standing. You're, you're in good standing. Rest assured, rest in Jesus' arms. You're guaranteed eternal life in, in, in heaven and new heavens and new earth. Don't worry about that. That's mm -hmm. nothing can change that. Right. But uh hey, uh God didn't uh, you know give you eternal life and stuff uh, just for fun, you know. He, he he has a purpose for your life, and it's a, it's a uh, it's a privilege. It's an honor. Now you're a child of God. You are a minister, a servant of God, an ambassador for Christ. What a great honor and privilege bestowed upon every one of us. So if you understand that, uh, now willingly become a, ser a servant or a slave to Christ. It's, it's it's not something that you're it's a burden forced upon you mm. it's a willing choice you can now become a slave a servant of god i mean come on jesus christ the creator of all things huh. <laughs> and, and you get to be his ambassador you get to be a his servant uh, it, so it, it's it's not something that we should look on as something that's imposed upon us and that's burdensome and, no. and you know no this yoke is easy to get yoked to Jesus to have the Holy Spirit yoked to your spirit right where your spirit's alive that's the easiest thing in the world just believe it and it's done mm -hmm. and then the burden is light well the burden then is just hey do you want to take advantage of the the the, the uh, relationship now as a child of God and, and uh, represent God. I mean, what a, what a responsibility. And this is where I see so much, I, I just, I'm so disappointed in many of us as a failure as ambassadors. Before we upload a video, before we press the button, send on our comments, we should think twice and, and, and ask ourselves, does this glorify Jesus? Am I saying, am I saying the things that Jesus is going to say? Thumbs up, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Luke, tell it, tell it. I, I'm afraid that so much of what we, we see in among this Christendom, this these pro, uh, professing Christians, that the, the way that we are conducting ourselves and calling ourselves ministers. And we are, uh, uh, it's an embarrassment. We're not drawing people to Christ. We're repelling them by our conduct. And I, I'm not seeing this in our congregation here. Thank you, Jesus. This congregation is growing and maturing. And we, we're not plagued by, by this. But uh, I think it's a, it's a caution to all of us before we speak. You know, I'm not a big fan of James. 
But I will tell you, I love this saying in James, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Let's slow down and think before we start opening up our mouths and sending comments and putting up videos that's just, you know, uh, that maybe if we're sensible, we will regret it later. Uh, uh, <laughs> at least I know Jesus re regrets that we do such things. Um, okay. Um, I don't want to just repeat everything that with, you've said. You've covered it very well. So now go to the coup de gras. That's you, Luke. That's you all day. That's your line. That's okay. your verse. All right. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes! If I could get up, I'd do the happy dance with you, man. Yes, I'd do oh. it with you, Luke. Yes, I'd do it with you. Because it's death. Because of sin, we have a death sentence on us. But we've been reprieved, we've been pardoned, we've been set free from that judgment, and instead, he's given us a gift of eternal life. I mean, people throughout all of history have been traveling around the world, seeking the fountain of youth somehow, and scientists and everybody, philosophers, they're all trying to figure out how can we get immortality, and you have been given it as a free gift from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. All right. Hey, Luke. Yes. I had to do one thing for you. I yeah. knew that uh, that verse would be a joyful verse for you. Now, I can't get up and boogie like you do. You're the dance master. And we all know it. Boogie, but I'm going to put, put in my little happy woo -hoo, dance. Woo -hoo. Sister, <laughs> sister, let's do these together. Sister. <laughs> Jesus, thank you, yeah. Lord. thank you, <laughs> yes, brother Chris, I hope you're celebrating with us, I am, you just can't see it, because I don't have a camera, <laughs> all right, all right, what's okay, up with right? that, why, are you, yeah. why don't you have a camera, I don't own one, I literally don't have a camera, I could easily get one, but I have one, okay, well, if you need one, we'll figure that out, okay, sure, all right. Well, that's the that's the uh, final verse. Uh, so you, you guys said, let me get your uh, your thoughts on Romans six twenty three. Go ahead, Renee. I'm sorry. Get my. I was laughing at us dancing. I saw the playback. What oh. what what did you say, brother Luke? Romans six twenty three. Preach it, sister. Teach it. Push it off. Here's the God. The wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. And guess what? You all owe that wage. Mm -hmm. but the good news is the gift, the free, greasy, grace, cheap, sloppy, agape gift is eternal life. Through yeah. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Mm -hmm. All to him, to him be the glory. And you don't get none because you can't put all him. Worthy is the lamb, not worthy is the lamb and you. It's all <laughs> he, all Jesus, all day, every day. And we will continue to contend for the faith once delivered into the saints. Because the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our this is Lord. Oh, that's Lulu. Yes. That's Lulu. This is Lulu. It's a new kitty. This no. is Brooke Pitten, Lewis. No. Tiger cat. You're allergic to cats, Jason. I know, I am. <laughs> I sure am. He's going, no. No. <laughs> he knows. No. Jim, Jim knows okay. I'm, I'm just Okay, playing. so let's say let's say you had uh you, you you could only have one verse for somebody. They're on a desert island and one verse washes up on shore and uh you know we could all pick there's a lot of different verses we could pick to say this is the one verse i want them to to receive and under you know understand uh, uh this would certainly be uh, on my list of hey this is the verse i want to get well john three sixteen is a great one but i'd have to say for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast it's clear that it's by grace and it also clarifies it's not of you and it's not of works of any kind. But you don't have Jesus' name in that verse. 
That's true. That's true. But uh, John 3.16 is the same thing. You know, we don't have his name there. Uh, another one would be, for him that works is the reward no longer reckoned of grace, but of debt. But for him that worketh not, but believes on him, Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, his face counted for righteousness. Mm -hmm. Both of those would be good. Mm -hmm. Brother Cripps? Romans 5. Romans 6, what do you think of Romans 6.23? All right, I'll do that first, and then I, I'll, I'll give my verse, my favorite verse that I have on the island. But um, so for the wages of sin, the whole time you're talking about that, and Brother Luke, when you spoke, you talked about um, reprieve. That's the word you used was reprieve. So when you said that, I get this mental image of a death row inmate, okay? He's in prison. The wages of his, uh, uh, of his crime is death. He is going to be sentenced to death. And uh, some sometime along in there, the warden comes in, tells him that uh, he's uh, been pardoned. He has a reprieve. He doesn't have to pay uh, the. Uh, he doesn't have to pay the wages of his um, uh, of his crimes, and he gets to go free. That's the mental picture that we should all get. We're born at, as that convict. We're born, and the wages of our of our crime, uh, the wages of our sin, is indeed death. But we get a reprieve because here's the beautiful part: the gift of God. The, the, it's the gift God gives us, eternal life through His Son Jesus, who came to pay the price, the recompense for our sin. It's it's oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Um, again, if I had the camera, we guys are dancing. I, I would be dancing too. I, and I am dancing in my heart and spirit. It absolutely is. Um, it means everything. When we know this, when we understand verse 23, when we know the first part, we have to accept that, that that's true. The wages of our sin is death. That's what we deserve. Okay. We deserve death. But the gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's the grace. We tried to define grace earlier. That's the grace in the scripture. We deserve uh, death, but uh, the gift is eternal life through Christ. And uh, lastly, just to finish it off, my verse that I take with me, it's the it's my favorite verse, um, that one that I memorized uh, in second grade that I, I never forgot the whole passage. Uh, Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's oh, it. that's a good one. That's, that's a good. You know what another one is? He who has a son has life, and he who has not the son has not life. Period. Boom. Period. Desert Island. That's all I need. Amen. Amen. All thanks, right. Guys. Okay. Uh, th thanks for hanging in all this time. We went longer than usual. Usually. It's oh, good stuff tonight, man. It was rolling. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, to the chat room, thanks everybody for participating. But look, I don't want to uh, leave this uh, unsaid. Uh, Brother Daniel, uh, he's at the emergency room. He had to take his son there. He's having difficulty breathing. So please, everybody pray now and continue to pray for Brother Daniel's son. Amen. Uh, Amen. Absolutely. And uh, okay, so uh, we'll continue this next Wednesday. Uh, and uh, we're working our way through the Pauline epistles. It's going to take maybe years before we get through it all. Oh. <laughs> uh, we, we've completed six chapters so far, of all of it. And uh, it's, a, it's a joy doing it. Uh, it is. Also, jo you can join me uh, two days from now, uh, Friday night interviews. Uh, I'm planning on inter interviewing Amanda, not Amanda, uh, um, um, Angel, Angel Martin. Oh, yeah, great. And, what time uh, is that? Eastern time? Yeah, 9 p.m. Eastern 9 time. Okay, perfect. And, uh, and then, of course, Sunday. Join us every Sunday at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time for the Church of the Eternally Secured live church broadcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, to the new people in the chat room, who, if you've never been with us before, I, I hope this was a blessing for you. I, I, I hope you uh, want to continue uh, having fellowship with us. And uh, Sister Renee, thank you. Uh, I, I think that in spite of all your uh, Ill, ailments and uh, pain and the difficulties, uh, I do think that this is uh, heal, healing your spirit. It's, oh, I yeah. Think, 
the time you spend with this, it gets your mind off of the other. Oh, yes, it other. does. Yes, it does. I'm feeling good. I, I got BC, Motrin, my regular medicine, Tylenol, Gabapentin, and blood pressure pills. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm in there. They can get, get and yell at me for having handfuls of pills, but, you know, if it lets me get up and praise the Lord, I'm doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, appreciate, I appreciate you uh, uh, having me, and I'm sorry I get a little late, but I really wanted to go to church tonight. I felt the need to go, and we lifted up some people in prayer there. And if Anthony's watching, I didn't see him, but Anthony Suarez, my entire congregation, was mm -hmm. praying for you, for you to get a kidney, honey. So I just wanted you to know you were on my heart tonight. Amen. Daniel, I I can't imagine the suffering of seeing our children suffer, the heartbreak. I remember my boy was three years old. It was the first time he ever got really sick. And the only time he got really, really sick, his ear was in pain. He had an ear infection. He was just holding his ear and crying. I remember begging God, give me his pain. Give me his pain. I couldn't stand it. Yeah. I couldn't. So I, my heart, I'm not only praying for your son, I am praying for you and your wife and your whole family to have the strength and, to, and not to be so heartbroken to see your child suffer like that. And I pray for the wisdom of the doctors as well. Amen. Okay. I stand with you All in right. that prayer. Brother Cripps, thanks again for join, joining us. And, yes, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, Renee, you can see her on her channel. Uh, she's making one, two, three videos almost every single day. Right. And she's also joining uh, our programs, our live broadcasts, uh, Talking Doctrine and Mine. And uh, and uh, then Brother Cripps, uh, you've got your Sunday night program, uh, True Story Live. So uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. you got a viewer in the chat room that lives in your city. He wants to get in touch with you, Rob Adams. Oh, here in Las Vegas? Yep. All right. Well, I have my, my email is sincitypreacher at gmail.com. So email me. All right. All right. Okay. Good night, chat room. You guys are awesome. Awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome. Yes. Okay. Uh, to answer your question, Robert Adams, yeah, I, I, I preached for, for five years on in front of the Bellagio Hotel. And I haven't been out there for a couple of years. I had a lot of health reasons, but uh, yeah, I've done preached over a thousand times out there. This is on air preaching. So it's the same thing, except you're not outside. This yeah. is on air preaching. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Thanks, Renee. Uh, thanks, Brother Cripps. Yes, Bless sir. you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.